Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Amanda Loraquenta. Amanda is interested in selfish DNA and its impact on genome evolution. She uses a variety of approaches to conduct her research. Amanda is studying a very interesting meiotic drive system in Drosophila that was discovered some 60 years ago, a system that continues to reveal its secrets, as we'll hear today. Amanda, thanks for participating in our webinar series. You're very much responsible for the series since it's part of a meeting program you and I and others organized that didn't happen because of the pandemic. So it's great to have you here and to hear you talk science. At this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Great. Thanks so much for, for having me. This series is going to be, um, it started off really great and it's going to um, continue to be great. There's a lot of good speakers coming up. So um, just to briefly introduce our interest, you know, we're very broadly interested in um, genome evolution in my lab, but what we're particularly interested in is selfish genetic elements, the conflicts that they can create within genomes, and how these conflicts drive genome evolution um, and species evolution. So I just want to give a brief introduction to what I mean by selfish genetic elements in case there's anybody in the audience who's not really sure what I'm talking about. So these are sequences that can increase in frequency in genomes or in populations. And they do this not because they offer some benefit to the host. In fact, oftentimes they're downright harmful to the host, but they can spread anyway. So let's go through a couple of examples. Probably the most widespread and famous example are transposable elements. So these are jumping genes that can move around in the genome and they can be quite harmful if they say interrupt a gene or if they uh, interrupt uh, the regulatory elements of a gene or they cause structural rearrangements, uh, but they can spread anyway. And we think of them as somewhat of genomic parasites that can proliferate in genomes. And in sexually reproducing organisms, transposable elements can also spread in populations. And so organisms have evolved defense mechanisms to limit the spread of transposable elements through the germline. So this is one very widespread class of selfish genetic element. Another overtly uh, selfish genetic element is, are the meiotic drivers. So this is actually what I want to talk about um, today. So one of the fundamental principles of Mendelian inheritance is the equal segregation of chromosomes to, um, to gametes, to so 50% of gametes. But in this normally fair process, there can be cheaters that arise and subvert the fairness of meiosis and bias their transmission to more than 50% of gametes. So these cheaters are called meiotic drivers and they can spread in populations even though they come or they tend to come at a, at a cost to the host. So we find meiotic drive in the male germline where it often manifests as sperm killers like the system we'll talk about today. And we also find meiotic drive in the female germline uh, where drivers can bias their segregation towards the oocyte instead of the polar bodies. And this is the kind of drive that if you went to this series last week and heard Takashi Akira talk, um, he talked about this female meiotic drive. So meiotic drivers are widespread in nature and across taxa. We have empirical examples in plants and in mammals and insects and in fungi. Now the last class of selfish genetic element that I'd like to introduce are much less conspicuously selfish. These are repetitive DNAs, huge blocks of tandem repeats uh, called satellite DNAs. And these can occupy really large regions of the genome around centromeres, and around telomeres, and they at least have the capacity to be selfish. I'll spend a little more time uh, later on in the talk introducing satellite DNAs in more detail because they are central to the system um, that I wanna discuss, but I'll come back to the introduction of satellites a little bit later. So all of these selfish genetic elements and genomes can create these conflicts that have a really large effect on genome evolution. So as the selfish genetic element is is cheating, the host genome evolves mechanisms to suppress or to resist that cheating. And then the selfish genetic element has to evolve around those host mechanisms and so on and so forth. So 
these conflicts can trigger evolutionary arms races that lead to really rapid uh, genome evolution. And this is the process that we're really interested in in my lab is in, in these conflicts and not just how they shape genome evolution, but how they shape the way organisms make gametes. And we use Drosophila species as models. Our main focus is on this male drive system um, that involves the satellite DNA in the famous model Drosophila melanogaster. And so that's what I wanna talk about. So first I'm gonna start off by introducing our drive system. It's called segregation distorter. Um, and I'll start off by talking about the genetics of the system and the dynamics of the system in populations from the perspective of the driver and uh, of the target. And then I wanna talk a little bit about what we've learned about mechanism. Um, by studying the regulation of satellites in the germline. We actually, we still don't know the mechanism. Okay, so the way that the system works is it's called segregation disorder, or I'll call it SD for short. Um, males that are heterozygous for SD and a wild type chromosome transmit SD to over 95% of their progeny, but females that are heterozygous for SD and a wild type chromosome transmit SD fairly to 50% to of their progeny. So this is a very strong male specific driver. And there's been a lot of really beautiful work done on the genetics of segregation disorder since its discovery. Uh, the genetics can be quite complicated. So I'm gonna simplify it uh, with a schematic here. And so this is showing you a schematic of an SD chromosome SD are, appear on second chromosome. So this is an autosomal drive system and Drosophila melanogaster. So this is a representing an SD chromosome. This circle here is the centromere. And then this gray shaded area is, um, it corresponds to the repetitive uh, regions in the pericentric heterochromatin around the centromere. So there are two main loci involved here. The driver is on the left arm of the second chromosome and the target is on the right arm of the second chromosome in this pericentric heterochromatin region. Now there are multiple alleles of the target that segregate in natural populations. SD targets wild type chromosomes that have sensitive alleles here, and it kills their sperm during spermatogenesis. So it turns out that SD is not just a selfish gene, it's actually a selfish co-adapted gene complex that consists of several loci that are spread across the second chromosome. Most of them occur on the right arm of the second chromosome. These other loci are enhancers. So SD can drive without these enhancers. So say the strength of SD could be 70% or so without the enhancers, but the presence of these enhancers can increase the strength of drive. So maybe it'll drive at 95 or 100%. Now, recombination or suppression of recombination is very important for any meiotic drive system to really get off the ground and increase in frequency of populations. And you can see why that would be um, important right here in the interval between the driver and the target. You have a recombination event um, that occurs in this interval. You can move this sensitive target onto the driving background and then the driver can target itself and kill itself. So suppressing recombination is just generally important, especially between the driver and the target. But suppressing recombination elsewhere on the chromosome is also really useful because it can help these enhancers stay in linkage with the driver. And so SD chromosomes tend to acquire chromosomal inversions that are segregating in the populations that um, it's in. And these inversions we think help suppress recombination and keep this complex together. So different SD chromosomes, different haplotypes that are in the populations likely have different suites of modifiers or enhancers. And we actually don't know the molecular identity of any of the enhancers or modifiers of drive, but we do know the molecular identity of the driver and of the target. So the driver is a partial tandem duplication of a gene called ran g activating protein or RAN-GAP. And this duplicated gene that's truncated encodes a protein that has wild type enzymatic activity, um, but it's missing some sites that are important for its localization in the cell. So it ends up say in the nucleus instead of 
um, staying put in the in the cytoplasm. And so this phenotype, this localization phenotype, we think is important for drive, and I'll bring that up um, later on. So the driver is a duplication of a gene. The target is not a gene. The target is this block of satellite repeats that we call responder, or we abbreviate it RSP. So this tandem block of responder repeats consist, uh, makes up the target. Now responder is a dimer of two closely related 120 base pair repeats. So this 240 base pair dimer is then tandemly repeated in the pericentric heterochromatin. Now this is showing an image of mitotic chromosomes in Drosophila melanogaster. And I'm using a probe here to show you where responders uh, is localized in the heterochromatin on the second chromosome. Now what's interesting about the satellite DNA is its abundance or its copy number correlates with the sensitivity to drive. So if you have a really large allele of responder with many copies of the repeat, uh, these alleles are super sensitive to drive. But if you have a small allele where you have fewer copies, uh, you can escape drive. SD is a sperm killer. Ordinarily wild type sperm have these nice needle shaped sperm heads. But if you were to look inside the testis of an SD heterozygous male, what you might see is half of these sperm have these nice needle shaped sperm heads. And the other half of the sperm are these round blobs. So these needle shaped sperm are the SD sperm that are going to make it to the seminal vesicle and be able to inseminate a female. And these wild type sperm don't mature um, and they have no chance really of inseminating a female. And so somehow SD is disabling these wild type sperm through a chromatin condensation defect that we still don't really understand. So now I wanna talk um, about the dynamics of this system in populations. SD is a system that is really captured the interest of geneticists and evolutionary biologists uh, since it was discovered in the 1950s and it's, it's studied quite intensely in the lab, but this system actually exists in nature and pretty much every population of Drosophila melanogaster across its geographic range, which is most of the globe, um, you can find SD. And in each of these populations, it segregates at these low, seemingly stable frequencies of between one and about 8%. So at first, this low frequency might be surprising because I told you how strong SD drive is. Many of the drivers are very strong um, at drive of more than 95%. Why isn't it more successful in these populations and segregating at higher um, frequencies? So we think that there's a number of reasons why that's the case. One is that SD chromosomes tend to have lethal or sterile mutations, and so that will limit their spread in populations because they can't be homozygous. Um, we do know that there are insensitive alleles of responder in natural populations that won't, uh, when SD meets one of these insensitive alleles, it won't actually have its advantage. And um, we know that there are suppressors of segregation distorted that can segregate at very high frequencies in populations. So it's probably a combination of these things that keeps the frequency low. So although the SD frequencies seem stable in populations or they seem similarly low when we look across populations. When you look closely, you can actually see that they're very dynamic. Um, so there are different types of SD chromosomes that are in these populations. We usually define them by the type of chromosomal inversions that they have. Um, so for example, here I'm showing a, a green type and a purple type that have different inversions. In this Longitudinal study led by Ray Latemin, this green SD chromosome that was common around the time that SD was discovered uh, seemed to be replaced by this purple SD chromosome when she went back to survey this population in 1979. So this rapid increase in frequency um, of this purple uh, chromosome was much faster than you would expect by genetic drift alone. And so it seems like it was driven by selection. So we wanted to understand if these replacement events, um, like what Ray Latemin saw in the North American population, are common, and if we can detect signatures of selection on SD uh, backgrounds. So what we did is we studied haplotype diversity at the SD locus, this main drive locus, on 53 SD chromosomes 
Um, some of them are new uh, that we identified and some were previously collected chromosomes and they represent a wide uh, geographic range. So the work that I'll show you uh, was led by Kara Brandt, who was a graduate student in Dave and Pressgrave's lab at the time. So Kara designed primers to amplify this whole duplication. Um, and we did PCR resequencing of these 53 chromosomes. And so here I'm just showing the haplotypes from the duplicate RAN gap, where in blue are the sites um, that are in common with the parent gene, which is the full length. Uh, gene, and the yellow are the derived sites on the duplicate gene. And so I just want you to really notice a, a pattern here. I don't want to talk in detail about this. So as you can see, there are four main haplotypes. Two of them are found uh, in African populations, and two of them are found in non-African populations. And I'm not going to go into detail, but what we see here is evidence for selective sweeps of at least some of these haplotypes. So as you can see, there's reduced nucleotide variation. There's not very many differences between um, the, the rows are individuals. So there's not many differences between individuals within a haplotype group. Um, and we also see significant haplotype structure, which you can just visually see looking at these blocks. And we see skewed frequency spectrum. We see an excess of rare variants when we do see uh, mutations in this background. So in this one uh, African population from Zambia, we infer that the sweep event was complete. So meaning that this haplotype arose in this population and replaced the rest of the SD chromosomes in this population recently. There's only one site that differs among all of these haplotypes or individual samples. And then in Europe, we see these two different haplotypes that segregated uh, somewhat equal frequency in our, in our sample at least. And both of these have reduced variation. Um, and so this looks like a partial sweep, but we have reason to believe that this French haplotype is the one that's replacing this other haplotype because of the longitudinal data that we have. So we do have some samples that were collected 30 years apart and that suggests that this French haplotype rose sharply in frequency over third, the last 30 years or so. And so this is much faster than you would expect by drift alone. And so I already told you about the similar replacement event that happened in North American populations. So taken together, um, this suggests that we have three different SD haplotypes that have recently undergone these replacement events or selective sweeps. We can only infer this from population genomic data in the Zambian population. But either way, this is suggesting that SD chromosomes aren't stable in their frequency. Instead, they look like they evolved in this dynamic equilibrium where SD chromosomes can compete with each other um, and replace each other in natural populations. These SD chromosomes in Zambia are particularly interesting to us because they're very strong drivers. When we do crosses with these SD chromosomes, we almost never see escapers. Um, and they also have this chromosomal inversion that seems to be essential for drive. So we don't know very much or anything about the molecular nature of these chromosomes yet. So how many enhancers, where are the enhancers? We don't know very much about that. Um, but what we can do is we can look at patterns of genetic variation on these chromosomes and that can give us some important clues about the genetic architecture of the chromosomes. And we can also look at the sweep pattern um, that we detected at this locus across the whole chromosome. And so what we did was we took a sample of 10 Zambian um, SD genomes, and we used this trick in Drosophila melanogaster to isolate haploid embryos, and we sequenced them with PCR-free aluminum. And we also have one genome that we've done with nanopore uh, sequencing, this long read sequencing technology, so that we could determine the breakpoints of, of this inversion here. So we collected these population genomic data and we can compare it to wild type samples from the same population that were sequenced and published as part of this public project, uh, Drosophila Population Genomics Project, uh, published in 2016. Okay, so first I wanna show you um, how looking at genetic diversity on SD chromosomes can give us interesting insights into the genetics of drive. Um, and I'll start by just showing you what the wild type population uh, looks like. So this is a snapshot of genetic variation in um, as this Zambian population. 
Here I'm showing you the entire second chromosome. So to orient you, this is the centromere. This is the left arm of the second chromosome. This is the right arm of the second chromosome. On the y-axis is a measure of nucleotide diversity. This is average pairwise nucleotide diversity per site or pi. And this gray shaded region around the centromere uh, corresponds to the region of pericentric heterochromatin. This is a, a region that has reduced uh, recombination by crossing over. And so this is typically what nucleotide diversity looks like across Drosophila melanogaster chromosomes. It's uh, nucleotide diversity is higher in the center of chromosome arms, and it dips down low around the region of centromeric suppression of recombination. So now I wanna show you what the SD population looks like <clears throat> in orange. And so this is showing you um, our resequencing data from, from just the SD, uh, Zambian SD chromosomes. And what you can see is that the genetic diversity mimics the wild type uh, genetic diversity until you get to RANGAP, which is this main drive locus. And then the diversity plummets down to near zero, and it stays that way across the centromere for another 23 and a half megabases or so down the right arm of the second chromosome before it recovers these wild type levels of nucleotide diversity. So this is a very large footprint uh, signature of a selective sweep. And what it means, what we infer that this means is that there's a haplotype in this region that rose to high frequency very quickly and all the linked nucleotide diversity was swept away with it as it increased in frequency in the, in the population. So this can happen on a large region of a chromosome like this if there's natural selection on a region of reduced recombination like under a chromosomal inversion. What I want you to notice is that the nucleotide diversity, this, this large window um, is, occurs well outside of the breakpoints of this inversion. We do know that inversions can suppress recombination for a large window outside of the breakpoints, but this is really extra large. So this is telling us something important, I think, about the underlying genetic architecture of this chromosome. What it's suggesting is that the target of selection is not just this one selfish gene. Instead, there must be a bistasis between this driver and something far away on this chromosome that's important for drive, uh, perhaps even outside of this inversion. So this is evidence that these Zambian SD chromosomes really do evolve like super genes or co-adaptive gene complexes. We can use coalescence simulations and approximate Bayesian computation to estimate the time of this sweep. And when we do this, we estimate that this, this sweep occurred between 1400 and 1800 years ago. So this is a very, very recent event. So to summarize what I told you about the dynamics of the driver, uh, we see very dynamic evolution of the driver over short evolutionary timescales. It looks like they can replace each other in populations. And in doing so, at least in this African population that we've looked at, they have this giant signature of a large selective sweep um, over the selfish uh, super gene. Um, now I want to shift to talking about the target of drive. Um, I'll start with what is the nature of this target locus, uh, because it's not a gene. And then I'll talk about how it varies in populations. And so remember, the target of drive is uh, this large block of tandem repeats um, that we call responder. It's a satellite DNA. And satellite DNAs are traditionally very difficult uh, to study, but also very interesting. And so I wanna take a few minutes and give more background about satellite DNAs, because I think it's, it's important um, context to have. So again, satellites are these large blocks of tandem repeats that can occupy hundreds of KB or even megabases in regions, heterochromatic regions of the genome, like around centromeres or telomeres or sex chromosomes. And most satellite DNAs probably don't have very specific cellular functions linked to the sequence of the satellite, but instead they play large structural roles in, in organisms. So for example, um, they're important for chromosome segregation and heterochromatin formation and in nuclear organization. And we think that eukaryotes have tight control over the regulation of their satellite DNAs. If you misregulate satellite DNAs, really bad things can happen. So satellite misregulation is associated with genomic instability and cancer, 
early senescence and aging phenotypes, chromosome segregation, or in the case that I'm talking about today, sperm dysfunction. So we're very generally interested in satellite DNA in my lab. And one of the reasons why we're fascinated by them is because these are the most rapidly evolving sequences in any genome. Species tend to have their own species specific profiles of satellite repeats. And this rapid divergence of satellite DNAs can create genetic incompatibilities between closely related species. So here's a figure I'd like to show from Patrick um, Faree's paper. And this is an image of mitotic chromosomes of a hybrid between two closely related species of Drosophila. And ordinarily these hybrids are dead and they're dead because this one species X chromosome has this red satellite and the other species X chromosome does not. And we don't know why yet, but for whatever reason, this divergence in satellites leads to this incompatibility. So we're very generally interested in what is driving the rapid evolution at satellite DNAs. And a lot of it could be neutral because tandem repeats have intrinsic mutational properties that just differ from single copy DNA. So for example, we have this blue tandem array of repeats, um, unequal crossing over and gene conversion. So unequal crossing over say between uh, two different repeats in two different places in this array can create a large expansion or a contraction of the repeats over a very short uh, time period. And so satellites are, can be very dynamic just because of these mutational properties. But we also expect natural selection to drive the evolution of these repeats because satellites tend to get caught up in intragenomic conflicts over germline transmission. So in the SD system that I'm talking to you about today, uh, there's a satellite DNA that's a target of a male drive system. So we expect this to influence the evolutionary trajectory of this satellite, this responder satellite. But satellites also have the capacity to be selfish themselves. And this is when, because of centromere drive. So in females, as I've already briefly introduced, there's this asymmetry in female meiosis where only one of the four products of meiosis becomes the egg, the oocyte, and the others become the polar body. And so there can be competition between centromeres over which centromere is the bigger, better, stronger centromere um, and can get, segregate to the oocyte more often. So they can gain a transmission bias through the female germline. Well, satellite DNAs are often found in and around centromeres and we expect them to participate in this kind of driving behavior like we heard about uh, last week in Takashi's seminar. And so satellites are targets of some drive systems and they can also be drivers themselves. So hopefully I've convinced you that satellite DNAs just generally are fascinating. Um, and in this case, in the case of SD drive, we really wanna be able to understand what the satellite is up to and why it's a target of drive. It's very difficult to know a lot about satellite DNAs or it has been uh, because there's no crossing over the satellite. So it's hard to do genetics. Um, the mutational dynamics I already told you about make it difficult to study. And it's very difficult to do genomics. And I'll just illustrate one reason why that is the case. So imagine if you have this blue tandem repeat here and you sequenced your genome and you have this blue sequence read, you don't know where this read came from unless there's some sequence um, that it, uh, is on it that is unique. Um, and you can anchor the sequence somehow in the genome. And so with traditional sequencing technologies, it's been very difficult to assemble satellites to, to look at their structure in detail. So what we in the field have been moving towards are these single molecule real-time sequencing technologies that produce very long sequence reads. Um, these company, uh, this technology is available from companies like Pacific Biosciences or Oxford Nanopore. So these long reads help us span repeats, anchor in unique sequence and build better genome assemblies. So we've been using these long sequence reads to assemble satellite DNA loci in genomes. And of course, our very first satellite that we wanted to focus on was the responder satellite. And so we've used this technology to study the structural organization, the organization of, satellite, of the responder satellite, the genome. So here's a schematic showing what we found. Um, our reference genome has a typical uh, sensitive allele of responder. And it's about 150 KB, the main uh, responder locus. 
And what we found is that it's not just made of responder repeats, but there are transposable elements in here too. And so I'll show you that in more detail in this plot. So here I'm showing a contig um, from our assembly that contains the majority of the responder locus. On the x-axis here is position along the contig in KB. And on the y-axis are counts in three KB windows of different types of repetitive elements. So the schematic for the locus to orient you is up here. And so these two different shades of blue are the two different flavors of responder repeat, because remember a responder is a dimer. And then all the other colors are different transposable elements. And so the structural organization of this target of drive then is this homogenized block of tandem responder repeats. And then towards the edges, we have insertion of transposable elements mixed with other responder repeats. And what's cool about just having this structural organization is it tells us something about uh, how recombination is really shaped uh, the satellite locus. We can tell that unequal exchange likely happens mostly in the center of the array and gene conversion too, which is actually what we expect to see. But the other great thing here is now we have this, this template to do functional and evolutionary genomics. So now that we, we can study this locus in populations. And before I show you uh, what we're doing with the populations, I wanna show you how we've used that um, assembly to now look at the responder locus on SD chromosomes, the insensitive allele of the target. So we've known for a while, um, initially from Chengyi Wu's lab, uh, but also some work in our lab that there are very few copies of Responder uh, in SD genomes. And we've estimated this with slop loss, with quantitative PCR, with Illumina, there's maybe about 20 copies of Responder in the genome. Now, Responder exists, the repeats exist outside of this main target locus. And so we wanted to know what the nature of this insensitive allele is. And so what we did is we took our reference responder locus uh, from our assembly, and we mapped reads from our SD genomes that we've sequenced, the data that I've already presented. And we can look at read depth along the length of the, the responder locus. In this grayish blue color is our uh, reads from our reference genome. And on the y-axis here is relative depth. And then I'm just showing the region of the major responder locus. And this is in the pericentric heterochrome to non 2 r remember. So what we see is that there's very uh, low depth, uh, almost no depth across this entire locus, except for the regions where there are transposable elements. And many of these reads actually might um, come from elsewhere. And so what this suggests to us is that these SD chromosomes have special responder insensitive alleles that correspond to a complete deletion of the responder locus which makes a lot of sense. And so now we can use this assembly as a platform um, for evolutionary genomics to look at populations and how they vary in responder copy number. And what we did was we uh, used the available genomic data from populations of flies from all over the world uh, to ask about the distribution of responder alleles in these populations. And remember the reason why we wanna ask this question is because small alleles should have an advantage in the presence of SD. And we know that SD is in many of these populations and is evolving uh, dynamically. So we took reads from each of these populations. These are data that are publicly available from population genomic projects uh, from Trudy McKay's lab and from Andy Clark's lab. And so what I'm showing you here are these box plots where the y-axis is our estimate of responder copy number. And then each one of these box plots in a different color corresponds to data from a different population. So there are two points that I wanna make about this plot. The first is that you can see that within populations, there's a huge range in responder copy number. And the second is that if you look at this gray dotted line, this is where we're indicating the threshold, or what we think the threshold for sensitivity to drive is. So anything above this threshold should be a sensitive allele. And so when we see this, we can see that most of the alleles in population should be sensitive to drive. And this is really surprising uh, to us because we know that SD is in all of these, or many of these populations. And so what is maintaining these uh, sensitive alleles? We did take a sample of some of these 
um, alleles and we tested them in genetic crosses to show that they are indeed sensitive to drive. And so this is interesting because flies that have a complete deletion of the responder satellite, like for example, SD has a complete deletion of the responder satellite. These flies are fine. So why hasn't the repeat been lost in these populations? I really like this quote from Barry Ganetsky. Um, I'll just paraphrase. He once called it peculiar that a satellite would exist just to be a target of drive. So what's maintaining responder in these populations? Well, one possibility is that while flies can survive without the satellite, they might be better off with it. And so a uh, responder satellite might be associated with positive fitness effects. And there are some experiments that were done here uh, where I am at the University of Rochester by Chung Yi Wu and his colleagues that show that that might actually be true. Uh, but now we're repeating these experiments with more precise uh, deletions of the locus. I'd like to throw out an, an, an alternative hypothesis out there, and that is that responder itself might be selfish. And so what I mean is that in males, we know these large alleles make responder a target of drive, but in females, it's possible because responder is adjacent to the centromere um, that the, the satellite might contribute to driving centromeres and larger uh, blocks of satellite might stabilize the centromeres or otherwise cause drive of the centromeres. So we don't have any evidence for this right now, um, but we've been able to make expansions and contractions of the responder locus using CRISPR. Uh, so we can start to ask these questions uh, and test these hypotheses explicitly in controlled genetic backgrounds. So we're really excited about that work, but we're not ready um, to present that yet. So I told you that the, the driver is really dynamic in populations. And so now what we're seeing with the target is that it's there's a large variation in copy number within populations. Um, these SD chromosomes have special responder insensitive alleles that correspond to a complete deletion. And surprisingly, these sensitive alleles are maintained in populations despite um, SD being around. And we're very interested in why that is. So seeing these dynamics, and in particular that the satellite is maintained, despite it being the thing that is allowing SD to drive, really prompts us to want to know more about what's going on at the molecular level. So its role in segregation disorder suggests that a uh, responder might have a germline function. That's possible, but we know so little about satellite DNA regulation in the soma or in the germline. So I wanna start by telling you what we've learned about the phenotype of a uh, drive in this system. And then I wanna talk about what we're thinking about at least when it comes to mechanism, uh, now from a different perspective, focusing on the satellite DNA. And I'll just say now that we don't, we don't actually, we don't have an answer here. We don't know what the mechanism is. So just to remind you of the phenotype, somehow responder is disabling wild type sperm through this chromatin um, condensation defect uh, through a mechanism we don't understand. So for some reason, this phenotype is a result of something going wrong at a satellite DNA locus. So I think understanding uh, what's going on in the system also will tell us something pretty general about how satellite regulation is important for spermatogenesis. So I want to introduce spermatogenesis in Drosophila species for those of you who are unfamiliar. So in Drosophila melanogaster, testes are these coiled tubes and, and uh, spermatogenesis proceeds in order through the tube. So germ cells develop within cysts and there are four mitotic divisions and the meiotic divisions. And then after meiosis, sperm uh, differentiate into mature sperm. They undergo this massive nuclear remodeling um, in the histone to protamine transition. And then at the end of this process, they individualize, come out of these cysts and are deposited in the seminal vesicle where there they can be transferred to a female during mating. So the SD phenotype uh, manifest after meiosis. And so we talk about uh, SD is not, it's not strictly a meiotic driver. Um, and it's not a dri meiotic driver in the strict sense. Instead, it's a, it's more a post meiotic driver. Okay, so the phenotype is after meiosis. And I'll show you a little bit more um, about this phenotype. So ordinarily, 
uh, during this process of differentiation, these newly haploid round spermatids have to undergo this pretty amazing transformation as they squeeze inside the nucleus of these uh, mature sperm. They have to shrink 200 fold. And so this nuclear remodeling um, is in part accomplished by swapping out histones for these small sperm specific histone like proteins called protamines. And so we refer to this transition as the histone to protamine transition. Now the first visible lesion in SD heterozygous testes happens during this histone to protamine transition. And early work from Dan Hartle's group suggested that there was a defect in protamine incorporation in these testes, in the SD testes. Uh, recent work from Janet McLean's lab also suggests that protamines are connected with the SD phenotype. And so we wanted to look at this directly. And we can do this by looking at RFP uh, tagged protamine. So this is work from Shalu Wei, as a, who's a graduate student in my lab. And we uh, did this work in collaboration with Benjamin Lopin's lab in Lyon. And so here I'm showing you a, a bundle of wild type sperm over here. And this is around the time of individualization. And so this DAPI channel is just looking at the sperm nuclei. Now we have this red channel showing the proteins and then we have the merge. And so what you can see is around the time of individualization, all the proteins should be incorporated. But what we see when we look inside the SD heterozygous testes um, sometimes is that half of the sperm have these uh, protamine, this protamine incorporation that looks normal, but the other half of the sperm do not. It, uh, they're missing the proteins. And so this suggests that there is indeed a defect in protamine incorporation. And in our collaborative work with the Little Pen Lab, uh, we suggest that defects in sperm chromatin are linked with the responder locus. Um, and we think that it's possible that they can trigger a, a checkpoint on sperm chromatin during spermatogenesis. And this is why you see this sort of catastrophic uh, phenotype across the whole nucleus. So I'm not gonna show that work right now. But our conclusion here is that there is a defect in this histone to protamine transition in these testes. But what is actually happening? What is the mechanism? The short answer is we don't know, um, but most of what we do know comes from really beautiful work from Barry Ganetsky's lab. And what they did is they focused on the role of the driver in this system. So remember the driver is a duplication of this gene called RANGAP. And RANGAP has roles throughout the cell cycle, but its most famous role is in RAN-mediated nuclear transport. So RANGAP is normally tethered to the cytoplasmic base of the nuclear envelope. And then together with its corresponding guanine nucleotide exchange factor, RANGAF, or RCC1 implies, um, which is in the nucleus, they establish a gradient of active and inactive forms of RAN across the nuclear envelope. And this is what contributes to RAN-mediated nuclear transport. Well, what the Ganetsky lab showed is that in SD testes, this truncated duplicate protein is missing sites that are important for its intracellular localization. And it ends up inside the nucleus instead of staying in the cytoplasm. And this is proposed to throw off this RAN gradient um, and disrupt nuclear transport. So but they, they proposed that there's some important uh, factor for chromatin condensation that's not really getting to where it needs to be to package the satellite uh, properly during spermatogenesis. So this work was truly groundbreaking, uh, but there's still a lot of open questions about, um, about this model. One is that this phenotype is very specific to the responder satellite. So why is that? What, what is special about responder? We still have no idea. Another point is, um, why is this specific, this phenotype specific to spermatogenesis? The RAN cycle is important for all cell types, um, in males and, and in females. And in fact, a lot of the assays that, um, that the Ganetsky lab did were, was in salivary glands because they were easier to work with. So there's still this question of well, what does this have to do with the satellite and, and why spermatogenesis? So there's a lot of open questions here. We're revisiting this mechanism question um, by focusing on the satellite DNA. It had been really difficult to study satellite DNAs and now we have um, some tools uh, that we can use hopefully to make some more progress. Um, if we wanna know though why misregulating a satellite DNA causes this catastrophic sperm failure, <laughs> then we need to know more about how satellites 
are regulated in the germline. So I want to just very briefly tell you what we're thinking about when it comes to that. A lot of our understanding about the germline regulation of heterochromatin comes from recent work on small RNA pathways, where chromatin regulators are guided to specific sites in the genome by small RNAs like endogenous siRNAs or germline-specific kiwi interacting RNAs or pi RNAs. So in flies, this is best studied in the context of how pi RNAs silence transposable elements in the female germline. Pi RNAs use a transcriptional silencing and post-transcriptional uh, silencing mechanisms to prevent the TEs from mobilizing in the germline. So they can target TE-derived mRNAs for cleavage, and they can direct heterochromatin formation um, and silence the, the transposable element transcription at the chromatin level. So what we were thinking is, like transposable elements, satellite DNAs are repetitive sequences and they can cause genomic instability. Uh, so we wondered whether they might also be regulated by this RNA pathway as well. So uh, the short answer is yes. We and others find evidence for satellite-derived uh, small RNAs in testes and in ovaries, including a responder. And looking at the size distribution, um, these are consistent mostly with pi RNAs, but there are some endo SI RNAs as well. So we don't really know what these small RNAs do in the germline. Uh, we have studied this in the female germline. We know much less about the testes. And what we've learned is that satellite DNAs like Responder are regulated in a way that's very similar to dual-stranded pyronate clusters, which is the source, uh, these discrete loci in the genome that are the source of pyronase that uh, are derived from transposable element sequences and that target transposable element sequences. So the transcription of pyronate precursors at the satellite is licensed by this very interesting non-canonical uh, pathway that depends on heterochromatin or H3K9 trimethylation for transcription, which is the opposite of how we usually think about uh, regulation of transcription. So we don't really know what these pyRNAs are doing, what the functions of these are in the germlines um, themselves, especially in the, in the ovaries where we've looked at this in, in detail, but we do have evidence that they're important for establishing heterochromatin at the satellite DNA in the early embryo. And this heterochromatin establishment is important for marking the satellites as sites of future pyronate production in the gonads later on. So this pyronate pathway is important for regulating chromatin status at the satellite DNAs, in, at least in the female germline and in the early embryo. So the, these figures are from our paper, our recent paper from Shalu in my lab, um, and Alexi Aravin's lab has also done some very nice recent work uh, showing the same thing. So we know very little or even less, I'd say, about the role of these pyronase in testes compared to ovaries, but we suspect that they're also involved in maintaining proper chromatin status at the satellite DNAs. And so in this model, now this is a hypothesis, these responder pyrene precursors would leave the nucleus, get processed into the pyronase, and then re-enter the nucleus to either modify or to maintain uh, chromatin or otherwise properly package the satellite DNA. And so one of our hypotheses or one possible model for how responder might be targeted by SD is if SD disrupts either the biogenesis of these pyronase or the localization or, or maybe the targeting of the pyronase. A number of authors have proposed a very similar model involving RNA interference pathways and drive. And the best evidence so far um, comes from work from Selena Gell and Rob Greenan, where they found that mutations in a gene that's important for the pyronase pathway uh, called aubergine, uh, can enhance meiotic drive. And so this is the model that we're currently uh, testing. And we do have some tantalizing evidence that responder pyronase are disrupted in at least one SD genotype, but we're still in the process of determining whether there's a causal relationship between this molecular phenotype and drive, and whether this is because of SD ran gap or instead one of the modifiers of drive. So stay tuned on that. And I'm happy to discuss that work uh, during the Q and A. So this is what we're thinking about as far as models of drive. So I want to um, wrap things up and summarize what I told you about today. 
I told you about the system segregation disorder and uh, Drosophila melanogaster. It's this very strong drive system. Um, and I told you about the dynamics of SD in populations that we see this rapid turnover of SD haplotypes and that it's evolving like a super gene. Um, at least in Africa, we see this really large sweet pattern uh, corresponding to the super gene. And then I told you about the dynamic evolution of the, the satellite in populations, that there's a lot of variation in responder copy number. And surprisingly, most of the responder loci appear to be sensitive to drive in these populations, which really makes us want to know what is maintaining the satellite in populations. And I told you um, what we are thinking about when it comes to mechanisms of drive. We can show now that there is indeed a chromatin defect in protamine incorporation. And we're getting some new insights from studying responder regulation. And I just wanna close by saying, I think it's easy to think of these meiotic drive systems as these weird dominant gain of function mutations that are more like curiosities. But I think these drive systems, I mean, they are widespread um, across taxa in, in nature. I think they're, they're ubiquitous. And in studying how they work, you know, in flies alone, we're starting to see some common themes emerge. That is, they tend to involve heterochromatin. For whatever reason, they tend to involve gene duplications. And small RNA pathways uh, seem to be another theme that's emerging. There's a number of other drive systems where uh, small RNA pathways uh, are, are coming out as a theme. And so what I think this means is that these drivers are exposing common vulnerabilities in, in spermatogenesis. And I think that we can learn a lot of just basic biology of heterochromatin, repeats, and spermatogenesis by studying these natural uh, drive systems. So with that, I'd like to thank the people uh, who did the work. I have an absolutely fantastic lab. This is a very outdated um, pre-COVID picture. But most of the work that I presented today uh, was from the people with the green arrows on their heads and the names up here. So I'll start on the right side. This is Ching Ho Cheng, who's studied, um, I, actually most of his work I didn't end up presenting today. Uh, he's focused a lot on suppressors of segregation distortion and their dynamics and populations. Um, Xiao Lu studies the regulation of uh, the responder satellite and uh, she's done a lot of the work uh, in, the, in the female germline and is working on the molecular mechanism of drive. Beatrice uh, studies the uh, population genomics of SD and populations. Uh, we work on this in collaboration with David Pressgrave's lab. Uh, Dan Eichbusch has helped out with the satellite regulation and Danny uh, was brave enough to start the long read sequence assembly in my lab when we first opened um, a bunch of years ago now. I'd also like to thank our collaborators in Lyon from Benjamin Lopin's lab, um, and of course, Stephen, who we collaborate on the population genomics with. Now, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to stop here and, and take them. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. That was, uh, that was wonderful. And I think uh, everyone will agree that it was a, gr a great talk, really uh, uh, just a, a great learning experience, certainly for me. I do have questions. Uh, let me also uh, remind the people in the audience that there are two ways you can ask questions. You can uh, chat them in if you'd like, and we'll take them. And or you can uh, use the raise your hand function. We'll try to recognize that and then we'll unmute you and you can ask your question live if you'd like. So either way will work just fine. Uh, we'll start here in a second, but I did want to ask one question, Amanda, from myself before we get started into the questions from the audience is that is the, uh, the low frequency phenomena that you see in nature. Um, I just want to clarify that I, I sort of picked up on the point. The, the reason why we see that in low frequencies is because of the rapid turnover of these, um, or was there another reason why SD is at low frequencies in, in populations? I think that there's a combination of reasons of mm -hmm. why SD is at low frequencies. So we know that there are lethal and serial mutations on these drivers. And so they can't be homozygous, but that can't explain all of the low frequency. They're insensitive alleles um, and suppressors actually, there are some populations where suppressors are found at very high, high frequencies. And so if the suppressors are there, then SD doesn't really have its advantage. Um, so I think 
I think there's a combination of reasons. Okay, great. So let's let's start taking some of the questions. I know you can see these too, but uh, let's take uh, Hector's question, um, uh, which is the size of the responder region in the system and the size of the centromere in uh, Takashi Takashi's talk system. Is there something in common in mechanism that uh, in the mechanisms that in, that's implied by the effect of the size of these regions? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So we know that in in males in the drive system, there is this very strong correlation between the drive sensitivity and and the size of the locus of the big alleles are get clobbered by SD, but the small alleles don't. Now, does it have anything to do with um, its juxtaposition to the centromere? Um, and does the responder have anything to do with centromere? Uh, we we don't know. We don't know. We don't know why it's a target of drive. We don't know why the bigger alleles um, cause problems and have more severe phenotypes. Um, we have seen some very interesting um, things when it comes to responder and centromere. So it's not the centromere. It's next to the centromere. Uh, there's a the cell line, Drosophila cell lines, like many cell lines, um, can have very strange re genomic rearrangements. It could be uh, aneuploid. And we have seen evidence that responder um, can uh, correspond to the centromere in some of these weird uh, genomic rearrangements. Um, and there's evidence from uh, Terry Little's lab that responder has at least the capacity to, to be at the centromere, function at the centromere. Um, whether or not that's tied to drive, I don't know. Okay. I'd guess that if there's any connection that it would be the mechanisms would be distinct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, you answered Mercedes' question here, so we're going to skip that one. And uh, But uh, Tom Price asked a question. If you're right about responder being a female drive, which drive would you expect to have evolved first? Oh, what a, that's a very interesting question. I, I, I do not know. I, so SD um, is only found in Drosophila melanogaster, uh, to our knowledge. And the responder satellite, this canonical responder satellite that's the target of drive, only exists in Drosophila melanogaster. We don't find it in its closely related species. That said, um, responder is a dimer of these two related 120 base pair repeats. Based on the divergence between the, the right and the left side of the dimer, um, we can infer that responder is old enough to have originated before the speciation event um, between Drosophila melanogaster and its sister uh, group, the simulans clade. And so that implies that uh, responder was lost in the simulans clade. And so it's hard to tell because responder really only exists um, in Drosophila melanogaster. Okay, so uh, Takashi has a question. Uh, does the responder satellite size correlate with the uh, kinetic core size? Um, that's an hmm. excellent question, Takashi. I don't, I <laughs> don't know. Um, I don't know. This is something that we're very interested in, though. We, we've made some deletions of the responder locus, or large deletions of the responder locus, using CRISPR. And one of the things that we want to do with that is ask if you have this big deletion in the pericentric heterochromatin or a big expansion in the pericentric heterochromatin, do we see a corresponding change in the centromere chromatin domain next door? Um, so we haven't, we haven't asked that question yet, but that's something that we want to do. We haven't looked at correlation with uh, kinetic core size or any feature of the centromere um, and the responder locus yet, but that's a very interesting idea. Yes. Yeah. Let me just remind our, our audience, you, you can chat in your questions or you can raise your hand and we'll be happy to unmute you. You can ask uh, Amanda directly. Um, great, okay. Uh, uh, Jeffrey has a question here. It says, great talk. Would, would a genome transgene of RANGAP duplicated outside of chromosome two induce drive. Um, I was wondering if the strict lineage between driver and the target is required for drive. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Jeffrey. That's, so the, the answer is yes, you can induce drive um, with a, with a, a, a transgene of, of rank gap outside of chromosome two. 
Uh, you can induce drive with overexpression of wild type uh, RAN gap. So like tenfold overexpression of wild type RAN gap mm. um, can also induce drive. There's a lot of different ways to push on this system um, and manipulate drive because uh, presumably because the, the main driver is RAN gap and there's so much involved in the RAN cycle. The other part of this is not, um, no, they don't need to be uh, linked. You can actually move responder to another chromosome and then target the other chromosome. So if you move responder to the Y chromosome, you will now have a sex ratio system. It'll, it'll target the Y chromosome. Huh. Okay. That's interesting. Really interesting. You know, I'm going to jump in here with a question or um, the, uh, the enhancers, which you said we know nothing about. Why, why are those have been so difficult to get a handle on? And, and the other part of this question was, uh, um, do the suppressors that have been found help with anything related to your the models that you're proposing here? Yeah, great question. We don't know what the enhancers are yet because they're either buried in the pericentric heterochrome tin where we don't have crossing over and it's very difficult to do genetics um, or they're in or are near chromosomal inversions and which also makes them hard to dissect with genetics. So, um, it's, it's been difficult to identify the, the um, modifiers for that reason. Um, and the suppressors, what did you ask about the suppressors? Yeah, I just wanted to know if the suppressors have given you any clues as to oh. um, mechanism or to the, the strength or weaknesses of, of the mechanisms that have been proposed. Yeah, no, also um, a great question. So we don't know what the suppressors are either. We've, we've tried to map them and we've narrowed down to an interval that's pretty big and has a lot in it, so we, we don't know what the suppressors are, but I think we can learn a lot by looking at the phenotypes um, in the presence of the, of the suppressors. So how do the suppressors modify drive? What are, what are we manipulating? Is, is it changing? What about the molecular phenotype or the cellular phenotype changes um, with the suppressors? And that's something that we've, we are working on, but we don't really know yet. But yes, I think that looking at the suppressors is going to give us very important clues about what is happening with drive. Yeah. Okay. Back to our, our uh, chatted in questions. Uh, Scott Keeney asked a question here. He says, sorry if you said this and I missed it. Uh, that's okay, Scott. doesn't matter. Uh, but I had the impression that the SD sperm in heterozygotes didn't look completely normal, less needle-like than in wild type animals. Uh, is that correct? And can you comment on the implications for fertility and re reproductive success, for example, in sperm competition? Um, that's a that's a great question. Um, we do think that generally there are costs associated with the driver and there's some evidence in other systems that the driving sperm are uh, less fit, that they don't uh, participate in sperm competition in the best way and, and they have some defects them, themselves. And the SD system though, there's not, um, there is evidence for fitness consequences associated with the SD, but I don't, cytologically, I don't, I don't think there's a major difference. The image that I showed you, um, the, I think the stage was slightly different because the SD sperm did look a little bit fatter, um, than they did in the wild type flock that I showed. Um, but I don't think, yeah, I, I, I don't think that's a consistent, there's a huge amount of variability in the phenotype, by the way, this like balloons on a string phenotype that I showed is a nice image that um, I grabbed from the, this Hartle paper uh, from a long time ago, but actually we see a huge amount of variation in this phenotype. Sometimes the wild type, the wild type sperm actually rarely look like these round blobs, but they always have a chromatin condensation defect. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the, I think this is just a slightly different stage. But that's, it's a really great question. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody for asking questions and, and keep them coming. I'm sure Amanda's uh, thrilled to be answering them. And it's a good sign that uh, people have a lot of interest in what you were saying. So Sarah Gilmore has a question. It says, if, uh, if responder is maintained because of a fitness advantage, any idea on the mechanism? Could it have to do with Takashi's suggestion above that responder has some effect on the kinetic or size or assembly? Yeah, I, I, so the, the answer is we don't know, but um, that's exactly what we're, what we're thinking about. 
And so that's one of the things that hopefully we can get at um, by having these, uh, these deletions and expansions of the responder locus, because now we'll have a controlled genetic background. And the only thing that should be different is in the copy number of the repeats. And so um, then we can, we can look at that uh, very precisely. But yeah, that's, that's what we're thinking is that because of its position, it might have something uh, to do with centromere stability. Yeah. Or function. Great. I'm gonna go down to, uh, first, of all, first of all, Tom Tom acknowledges your answer. Tom Price acknowledges your answer and says, thanks. And uh, let's go to Logan, uh, who has a question. Rel related to the low levels of, of drive in nature, I'm wondering how well characterized the mechanism of suppressing drive is. And uh, do you think it's just the deletion of the target or is there something else as well? Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, the, we don't know is, is the answer. So, most, most of the time, that's the answer when it comes to SD. Uh, we don't know what the mechanism for suppressing drive is. The, so as far as the target, the deletion of the target, those are insensitive alleles. So here we're distinguishing between um, a locus that has evolved the ability to suppress drive um, and a deletion at the target. And resist. I, I would think of that as more like resistance to drive because you've gotten rid of the, the target of drive. But yes, we don't know um, how the suppressors work yet. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yes, I was just looking at uh, some notes here and uh, uh, let's see if we have any more questions as well. And uh, ah, okay, yes, okay. I, Eddie, Eddie Pan, a uh, great talk. Responder region is located immediately adjacent to the centromere and chromosome 2R. Consider the size and high copy numbers of satellite DNA sequence. It's interesting to think it also affects centromere function too. It's if it's possible to move this RSP to a far distance from the centromere and still show similar phenotype. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, I, I'm, I'm very happy that now we have the ability to be very precise with our language about centromeres and, and the locations of the satellite. So at the cytological level, responder is adjacent to the satellite. So if you're looking at mitotic chromosomes, but now we actually know exactly what the centromere is, um, where the kinetic core is sitting. And responder is not exactly adjacent. It's adjacent to the satellite that does touch the centromere, I guess I could say. Um, so, but it is very, very close. So if you move responder to a different place in the genome, you will still get targeting of SD to that new location. And I'm just trying to think of how those experiments were done um, it's really like it, like taking a sledgehammer to the locus because none of these experiments have been able to, to be done very precisely, just moving the responder satellite to a different place in the genome. These are done with very large structural rearrangements that also involve sequences outside of the satellite. So it's possible that there's something adjacent to the responder that, um, that makes those experiments work. So um, yeah, so I would say, yes, you still target uh, responder if you're far away from the centromere, but with the caveat that these are done with imprecise large structural rearrangements. Yeah. But do you think that some of the technologies we have now for genome engineering might, might enable you to do something um, along those yeah. lines? Yeah, I think that we could, we have a better chance of addressing that now. Um, I've told you that we're using CRISPR to modify the yeah. actual endogenous yeah. satellite locus, but I think that we could you know, plop responder um, in a different place in the genome, just responder repeats. Um, yep. There are backs that have responder in them and not mm -hmm. much else. So at least we could use uh, the backs or there's probably something very cool that I don't know about a way to move uh, those, a big block of those satellites to another place in the genome. Yeah. You know, this, this system is incredibly complex and uh, I wonder if, uh, uh, if you have any thoughts on or, are there other systems? It's certainly there's a on the spectrum of, say, simple uh, toxin antidote systems versus uh, this system. Is this sort of the extreme that you know about in, in your you know uh, knowledge of meiotic drivers? 
in terms of its com seemingly complexity? You know? Oh, complexity? Um, no, I don't. I don't think. No. I don't think that it's an outlier. I think that most of the drive mm -hmm. systems that we know about are more complex. They're not, you know, just these simple two locus yep. um, drive target uh, systems. You know, take the T haplotype for example in mouse. Um, that involves a large section of a chromosome, multiple chromosomal inversions, multiple loci involved in drive. Some of the sex ratio systems that we know about also have. Uh, complex uh, structural rearrangements um, that are involved in drive and more than one uh, drive locus. So I think in that way, um, SD is is pretty typical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So um, I see our, our audience is, is getting low on questions. I'm going to uh, uh, share my screen. And uh, at this point, I think since uh, our audience has sort of run out of questions. I want to say, uh, Amanda, thanks a lot for, for giving the talk. Re really great uh, talk. Um, and before I wrap up, I see Pratima just chatted in a question. So before I, before we go, I'll, 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 we'll go to Pratima's question. So, so Pratima, she uh, says a thought experiment, wondering about the evolution of segregation disorder. Would SD prefer, preferably result from a duplication event on a chromosome with a short repeat of responder? Would large repeats of responder be somehow harmful and SD actually regulates responder expansion? Um, so I do think the driver would, um, has to arise on, a, it would arise on a background um, that is insensitive to drive. So it would be linked to insensitive alleles of the, of the target. And would it manip or would it uh, somehow affect um, the regulation or evolution of the responder locus, or at least mutations of the responder locus? I do think that um, anything that destabilizes uh, the that region, so destabilizes chromatin um, and makes the region more volatile or, or easier to um, mutate, I think could accelerate, could introduce uh, more mutations at that locus in the population. So yeah, I could see, I could see that happening, but we, yeah, we have no idea. 